Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. Okay, so Henri Bergson, this video we're talking about memory. The next couple of videos we'll be talking about memory as well. Uh, in this one we're going to focus kind of on memory as it's um, as it as it concerns, as it relates to perception. So the first thing we'll look at is creating memories. So the past survives in two forms, Bergson says, two kinds of memories, or two, two ways of, of preserving memories, motor mechanisms and independent recollections. So looking at motor mechanisms first, this, these are what he calls habit memory. Uh, and so obviously closely connected with action. Um, and three points to note about this. First, they are acquired by repetition. So this kind of memory is, it's memory which is kind of locked into the body, right? So again, that focus on the body, which is so great in Bergson. Uh, these, this habit memory, habit, okay, same thing. It's, um, it has to be acquired through repetition, performing some activity again and again. Demands the second thing is it demands a re a decomposition and then a recomposition of the action. So in order to get this habit memory, in order to set it up, if you like, in order to instill it in the body, you, you have to first break down the task, decompose it, and then put it back together step by step. So that's the way way that we always learn how to do things. Which things which will eventually become automatic, which will be completely, um, we will be able to, to carry them out without thinking about them. Playing the guitar, or that's the example I, I often go to um, for this habits. Um, at first time you do it, you kind of, there's resistance. You have to break down the activity step by step, put it back together. Cool. And the third thing, is uh, the this kind of this memory this this kind of memory habits are stored in a mechanism which is set in motion as a whole by an initial impulse and always takes the same length of time. So it's it's um, a part of habit memory that you know in order to reproduce it you have to go through that same sequence of events you have to start at the start go to the middle and stop when you get to the end but you always have to go through it so if it's learning to play a song on the guitar you have to start at the beginning work through it it always takes the same amount of time i mean the length of the song maybe your your playing will speed up but the the thing that you're instilling in, in habit memory is something that, that always has to take that same length, has to start at the beginning, finish at the end. Uh, and it's it's kind of understood as a whole, set off by an initial an initial impulse, but, but once you've got it locked in, um, it just goes kind of by itself, carries, carries itself forward. Now this is opposed to the second kind of um, memory, or the way that we, yeah, you know, the second kind of memory, independent recollections, or Bergson also calls them memory images, or also representational memory. So this one, um, three more, three things to, to note about this as well. This can be imprinted immediately in memory as an event. Uh, I should just mention this. This kind of memory is, is um, what is it? I think it's episodic memory. Um, that that's the the modern term for it, but this is this is the memory of things that have happened to you. So as you live your life, right, everything that's happening is kind of being tucked away in memory. You're not remembering everything. I think the the notion that you remember absolutely everything you perceive, even though you're only able to access some of it, that's a myth. But 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 what happens during the day, you remember most of it or some of it or however much of it you want to you want to say but um it's that kind of memory that we're that we're talking about what did you eat for lunch this morning where did you go yesterday this is all um 
these, these memories that I'm asking you to recall now were formed through this process, not through habit memory, but through this, this um, representational style of kind of memory. So these are imprinted immediately in memory as an event, like there is just being, there's a log kind of running, continually running, and every moment, it's every moment is being stored in that log, or every event. Again, not every event gets stored in the log, but but um, but that's the kind of memory we're talking about here, as opposed to habit memory, which requires repetition, right? Um, just bear the bear the, the uh, keep that that um, comparison in mind. The second thing is this one can be grasped at once as a whole. So I can think about um, you know what what I had for lunch yesterday without having to run through what did I do when I got to the restaurant, what did I order first, what came, blah, 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 going through the whole sequence. I can just, I can, I can, in one intuition, I can grasp this, this memory. Or perhaps put a whole bunch of memories together and grasp what happened yesterday as a, as a kind of a totality, a whole. Again, as opposed to habit memory, which requires that, that repetition from start to finish. And these independent recollections bear a date. So they, an essential part of them is that they happened at a certain time or on a certain day. And that means they're non-repeatable, fundamentally so. Unlike habit memory again, which is repeatable because it's not connected with a certain time or place. It's uh, that the the habit memory is, is locked in the body without reference to a certain date or place. Unlike the this representational memory, for which the, those kinds of things, when they happened, are um, are cru- crucial. He then talks, he goes through a couple of, as a, well, he discusses these two different kinds of memory. Um, and some of the things that he says, habit memory is directly useful. So it's very practical, right? Again, Bergson's focus on the body, on practical activity um, comes through here. So these ensure our correspondence to the environment. They let us live our lives. Nice. Memory images, on the other hand, are also useful in guiding choice, but um, not from, from from a different kind of angle, right, from a different perspective. So they're they're also they play a role in in practical activity, um, and when it comes to making decisions, but this can happen automatically. So we're not always conscious of it. We're not always directing it. But it can also happen by a certain effort. You know, we put in that effort to, to get the appropriate memory, which lets us make a decision in a certain situation. Um, but both of those happen. And this, the representational memory, only higher life forms have it. So only, only from what we, as, as far as we know on Earth here, only those um, animals with well-developed nervous systems, perhaps, or at least, perhaps all, in all cases, a pretty complex brain, which lets um, you know, us take in a lot of information, process it quite quickly. This very, oh, very mechanical way of, materialistic way of talking. But, um, but yeah, so only higher life forms, only those, those, um, Animals, right? So we're talking about animals, which um, we typically think of as being kind of higher on that ladder of intelligence or cognitive capacity, however you want to describe it, have representational memory. And this is connected back with what we talked about, practical freedom. Because um, representational memory requires that we be able to withdraw from the action of the moment. We have to be able to step out of that, um, that, that continual 
stimulus response pattern of engagement. We have to be able to reflect on what's happening in order to change it. Um, and a nice expression Bergson use, uses, we have to be able to value the useless. So something that doesn't have immediate practical value, we have to, it's, it's being able to adopt that spectator mode, if you like, on the world. The will to dream is also how Bergson puts it, which is nice. Okay, so that is creating memories. That's how the past survives, those two different kinds of memory, motor mechanisms and independent recollections. Let's move on to recognition. Okay, so we've got our memories. How do we recall them? What's, what's the process of recognition? The example that Bergson gives is uh, imagine you, you meet someone, you see someone who you have whom you've already met uh, and you recognize them. So how does that happen? Uh, the normal explanation we would give is that the perception um, kind of triggers the appropriate memory, right? So my current perception of this person um, triggers the memory of meeting them last week. But Bergson asks, how does that happen? How is it that the current perception triggers the appropriate memory unless recognition has already occurred? Unless I've already recognized that face, how is, how is it that I'm able to go straight to the image, the memory image um, of that person? How is it that I'm able to filter out all of the other memory images I have unless there's already some kind of recognition going on? What is it that's, how is, how is this process this taking place? The normal explanation is that this happens through mechanical movements in the brain, right? Um, so, you know, your sensory inputs, electrical signals, sets off, a whole bunch, you know, neural neuronal firings and certain certain patterns, and and that is what the process of recognition is. It's all this kind of um, mechanistic process. But that that would require that memories are stored in the brain first, which opens a whole box of problems for Bergson and something that we've already rejected. Um, and Bergson adds to that by saying that if if this is true, if this mechanical model of perception of sorry of, of recollection is true, recognition should always be possible if the memory images are retained. So if this is all that's happening, it's all just sensory stimulus, electrical signals, neuronal firings, and it, this all takes place um, automatically, then as long as the memory images are there, there should be nothing to stop the correct memory being brought forward to match the perception. But he talks about um, a, one woman with psychic blindness, and she was able to recall the town, I think it was the town where she was born, she was able to recall that when asked about it in her, in her imagination and describe it perfectly perfectly fine so the memory images were there so she had the the images in memory but when she went to the town itself she didn't recognize anything she wasn't able to to to, to martin to note any landmarks she wasn't able to direct the people she was with because she didn't recognize anything even though she had all of the memories um in her <laughs> what do I say? Even though she had all of the memories. Um, so that tells us that this mechanical description is missing something. Something, Something's not right here. Something's not, not complete. So what does Bergson think about recognition? Well, he thinks there are two kinds of recognition. The first is instantaneous. He also calls it original recognition 
and recognition by inattention. So this is uh, recognition which is is um, connected to body uh, to motor tendencies. So again, connected to the body, to action, to reflex. Um, another just such a great, great aspect of Bergson's philosophy: this this focus on the body. We are fundamentally embodied. And it's not a case of, you know, a mind controlling the body or a body impacting the mind. It's, it's, it, the relation is close. The relationship is closer than that. There is this, an inextricable connection. Um, and so this, that, that kind of way of thinking is borne out in this, this first kind of recognition. He says, and this is an interesting way to put it too, to recognize a thing is to know how to use it. So that's, again, just this in instantaneous recognition. Just the, the, the capacity to know what to do, to know how to move my body, to orient myself, to engage with or use this object, that, that in itself is a form of recognition. doesn't have anything to do with the mind, doesn't have anything to do with concepts it's just purely uh, this physical engagement to recognize a thing is to know how to use it i, I really like that that idea and it, that has come up with it was in heidegger it's uh, it came up with uh, merleau ponty after bergson as well um bergson's own analogy is like the way that this instantaneous recognition is like the way each note of a tune leans over into the next, kind of carrying us on to the next. It's not a standalone note, and so the tune is not a whole bunch of notes strung together, but each note kind of kind of leans into the next one. The next one's coming. Same idea with this instantaneous recognition. It's where where our body is kind of pulled into into a, a reaction or, or into a, a, a kind of engagement with this thing um, <clears throat> without it necessarily forming concepts or, or having any kind of cognition going on, but yet we are, um, we're recognizing, we recognize the thing. Our, in a sense, our body, our bodies recognize the thing rather than our minds. Uh, so that's cool. He talks about this appearing, or evidence for this, I guess, showing in, uh, in patients, again, with psychic blindness, but for whom the bond between perception and habitual movements is broken. And he talks here about a patient who has lost the ability to copy drawings of letters just by noting the general organization of the letter and reproducing its shape continuously so the, the this particular person can't just take a shape see a shape and and reproduce it with it with a, a smooth continuous motion because they don't have the feel of the shape they're not able to to they're not recognizing it in their perception and that they're not recognizing it in uh, in a way that translates to um action instead for this this particular person they have to take the break the shape into bits into pieces into chunks and then reproduce that chunk by chunk that's how this person um, approaches this task of copying the letter they're only able to, to do it when they abstract out from the whole and pick a pick it apart break it into parts and reassemble them um and, and there's a nice expression Bergson uses here. He says the, the tendency to adopt and reproduce the general movement of the outline is no longer present in his hand. Nice way of putting it. Merleau Ponty says things very similar. Um, he's just lost that capacity to, or the, the movement of the object is not there in his hand. He's not able to, to engage that 
um, this kind of recognition, and that that's evidence for the fact that it's there, that it is a, a valid kind of recognition, because we see it when it breaks down, even though um, the memory image is there, the guy is able to to recognize the letter, but when it comes to copying it. He, uh, he has to break it down. And by the way, I think I think with this guy, he was also able to, he could he could draw the letters fine, um, spontaneously. It was only when he was asked to copy them that the problems arose. So it's a, it's it's a very specific um, instance of recognition that we're dealing with. Cool. So that's the first kind, instantaneous recognition. The second kind of recognition is willed. Um, and this is recognition, also called recognition by attention. So, attention. We need to look at a little bit um, at attention here. What is attention? Typically, we think of attention as an intellectual state. Again, mental, cognition. But for Bergson, attention is actually an adaptation of the body, first and foremost. It's not Obviously, it's not exclusively that, but... We are fundamentally embodied. Everything we do is going to to be connected or related to the body in some way, including attention. Um, so rather than thinking of it as, he, he says, a concentration of the mind, we need to think of it as also including the body. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. But um, willed, Recognition takes place through a double movement. The first is negative in the sense that it arrests the practical drive. So it's that, that capacity to detach from that stimulus response um, cycle. Detach from it and become a spectator in a way. So the negative arrest that practical drive into the future so we're, we're halting that and the positive half of this movement is where memory intervenes on perception adding images that are relevant to it and this is a turn toward the past so we've got this double movement in willed recognition um, arresting the drive into the future and turning to the past with um, through memory. Right, now, attention. So we'll come back to attention here when we look at exactly how it is the correct memory image is chosen. So remember, this was, this was the, the question from the very beginning of, of uh, this section. How is it that the correct <clears throat> memory is, is brought forward for the current situation. And the answer for Bergson is movement, in a word. So movement is the key that, um, that gets, that draws the correct memory image out. Um, <clears throat> accomplished, he says, or nascent movements mark out the field in which we shall seek the image we need. So that, that's really the crucial point here. Accomplished movements or nascent movements, they mark out the field in which the image can um, appear within. So again, very much bodily. It's, 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 this is um, we're, we're an embodied agent here. And it's that which, which um, this, this reference to action which connects us to the appropriate memories. I, I kind of think of this as like a, a way of a bodily attunement to the image that we want. It's like re, re-engaging the body in the same way, um, that, in, a, in a similar pattern, in a similar posture to... Um, which allows the, the appropriate memory to come forward. So he talks about the memory image 
whose shape then might fit into this attitude, encountering less resistance than other images. So it's a very... Um, we have to kind of think about this in a, in a very... We have to think about it the way that it actually happens, the way that recognition actually happens, right? We, it's not like sifting through... Um, it's not, not like a computer, right? Which is running a, an algorithm, searching through all of the images for certain key features. Right? That's not what's happening when we, when, we, when we recognize someone or something. Rather, it's more like, it's, it's more like, um, it, it is, I think, it's, it, it's, it's almost like our bodies are gearing into the right frame of mind in order for this, this image to come out. You know, when, when you're thinking of, that, that's what leads to things like, it's on the tip of my tongue, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not something that, nothing, no image is ever on the tip of a computer's tongue, right? That, that doesn't even make sense. Not just because computers don't have tongues, but but because it, it, computers don't have that kind of ambiguity in their lives. You know, a thing is either there or it isn't, or it's um, corrupted. That terrible, a file's corrupted. We can't read it. Forget about it. Um, we we have this. Uh, we kind of know what it is, but I just can't quite put my finger on it. This kind of this this is the way that that humans live. This is what human life is. This is what distinguishes it from machines. This is how we know that we're not computers and that we know that computers, certainly the way that they are at the moment, will never be able to replicate or um, duplicate what we do in the way that we do it. They excel in, in their own fields, of course, in their own narrow domains but and they excel that they outperform humans for sure but they're not able to do what we do the way we do it um, that's because they're not doing the same things that we are doing you know uh, and this this I think gets to a part of why that's true because we are fundamentally embodied we are bodies we're not just minds that are, that function like computers that are information processing that's not what a human being is um, and Bergson's just linking this in with the body it's it's a it's a fundamentally engaged way of being um, bodily engaged engagement and that that stretches through to the way that we recognize things recognizing and, and recalling certain memories it's not. It's not. It's not purely mental. It's a. It's a bodily um, type of engagement. Let me give you a quote. <clears throat> Motor activity, instead of continuing perception by useful reactions, turns back to mark out its more striking features. Then the images which are analogous to the present perception, images of which these movements have already sketched out, so to speak, the form will come regularly and no longer accidentally to flow into this mold. So we're not we're not getting just it's not it's not a brute force search through our memories, rather motor activity, our our um, our bodies are gearing us into to sketch out a kind of a shape, if you like in which the correct or the appropriate um, perception, uh, sorry, the appropriate memory will fit. Um, basically, reversing the way we normally think about recognition. Rather than the mind leading the body around, Bergson suggesting that the body, through implicit and nascent motor habits, which are aroused by perception, is what guides explicit conscious recognition by establishing a field in which an associated relevant memory image might be contained. Hello, Milo Ponti, right? Fields. That's, uh, 
If you've read Phenomenology of Perception, no surprises there that Bergson's talking about fields as well. <clears throat> um, but the field is not something, it's not a mental thing. We're not, we don't, it's not concepts. We don't have abstract notions, abstract ideas, which, uh, which we're using here. It's, it's the body, which is, we, we kind of talked about it in the last video too. The, um, the perception you have, the current perception, your body is, is adopting a posture. Even, even though it might be a slight posture, even though it's, sorry, a slight change, subtle change, but your body is, is adopting a posture in relation to that perception. And it's that posture which, which puts us, it sets up this kind of, to use Bergson's word, the field in which the correct memory image will fit. Um, and we, we talked about it last in the last video with things like colors, right? Certain colors make the body adopt certain um, postures, even though it's subconsciously, even though it's subtly. But that all contributes to, you know, when, when the body's in that posture, then certain parts of, of certain memories um, uh, become, if you like, more accessible. They're, they're more drawn to um, the current perception. So I really like this idea. It's nice. Bergson calls it, this field, a background of generality, which, again, just, just gives us a nice feel for what he's talking about. And into that background of generality, only certain um, memory images will fit properly. So Bergson calls this whole, whole process of um, willed recognition reflective perception, and he illustrates it with this diagram. So we'll have a look at it. Uh, in the middle there, you can see that line O, that's the object itself, the object that we're perceiving. The A is basically um, our perception, our immediate perception. It doesn't contain any any memories, it's just just our first perception of the object. The, the higher um, loops, B, C, and D, they are our forays into memory. But importantly, what you'd think maybe by looking at this is that D is going further back, accessing more memories. That's not the case. For Bergson, our whole past is with us all the time. So it's not like um, I'm only tapping into some of my memories when I, um, when I perceive something. My whole past is with me, but not all conscious, but I bring it with me. And, uh, and, and every perception has access to the whole of my past. Again, not, not explicitly. It's not like I'm remembering everything that's happened and bringing that. But, but all of my past informs my, my, my current perception, even if I'm not explicitly thinking about it. So B, C, and D is not a, a movement further back into the past. Um, rather, D elicits the most and the most detailed memory images. Um, so it's more like, I think Bergson will, will talk about this later, it's more like focusing a camera on certain parts. Um, so the further back you, or the further through these, these uh, circuits you go, it's not accessing memories that are more distant, but it's, it's kind of accessing more details in, in, in memories. It's, it's identifying um, memories in more in more yeah more detail huh? I don't how many times am I going to say that um, more fine grained if you like it's 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 the loop is longer so it's more as you can imagine like uh, the memories are being spread out over a longer space so there are more of them I'm remembering in more detail that's kind of kind of the idea 
the lower circuits there, B, B, C, and D prime, those are all the growing depth that's virtually given with the object. So we've got the object, um, as, as I, um, more memories are being brought to bear on the object, then that, that's reflected in these, these lower B, C, and D circuits. B, C, and D prime circuits, which are like he calls them actually the reflection of the expansion of memory. So the expansion of memory is the top half, the um, reflection is the lower half, and that's that is the synthesis of perception and memory. So that that's the the memories um, feeding into that perception and fleshing it out with with. Um, with things that I've experienced, with things that I remember. So they're kind of built at the same time as the upper, as, as the, the, um, the, I recede or as I, as I, my, ooh, as, as I'm accessing memory through B, C and D up top, those reflections are being, well, that, that, that mem, those memories are reflecting into the object, um, B prime, C prime, and D prime. I think that makes sense. I think I kind of I made a mess of that explaining it. Um, and that's that's kind of what happens in the reflective mode when you're when you're accessing those memories. But action reverses this expansion into memory. So the memories then converge until A, at which point memory and perception coincide and action takes place. So we can imagine that this, the way I think he's getting it there is it's it's like a, an expansion and then a contraction back into into the object that, that's kind of brought the memories forward. Um, that's that's kind of how I see it. I've got a quote which I'll read for you. Oh, he talks about that process by the way as as the memory image. Ah, oh, yeah, this is important. The memory image proceeding from virtual to actual. So prior to being um, mixed up, synthesized with the perception, with the actual our perception of the object itself, prior to that, the memories are virtual. They have no effect. They're just kind of there. Um, but in order to become actual, in order to become concrete, you might say, they have to partake in action, which means they have to be part of a perception. They have to, they have to get a foothold in the world, and this is how they do it. So that that um, that contraction, that the opposite of that memory, that expansion into memory, that contraction into the pre, into the perception, that's the procession from virtual to actual. The memory image itself, if it remained pure memory, would be ineffectual. Virtual, this memory can only become actual by means of the perception which attracts it. Powerless, it borrows life and strength from the present sensation in which it is materialized. Cool. That's just what I was saying. He, he goes on to give a nice... Um, a lived kind of description of, of this process of recollection, which I'll read for you um, in its entirety. It's a little bit longer, but here we go. Whenever we are trying to recover a recollection, to call up some period of our history, we become conscious of an act sui generis, by which we detach ourselves from the present in order to replace ourselves, first in the past in general, then in a certain region of the past. A work of adjustment, something like the focusing of a camera. But our recollection still remains virtual. We simply prepare ourselves to receive it by adopting the appropriate attitude. Little by little, it comes into view like a condensing cloud. From the virtual state, it passes into the actual. And as its outlines become more distinct and its surface takes on color, it tends to imitate perception. Okay, so quite long, but, but that, that's a nice description, which I think we can match quite quite closely to that diagram um, 
We detach ourselves from the present, replacing ourselves first in the past in general, so that as we, uh, or in the past in general, then in a certain region of the past, so that as we kind of move up those circuits, B, C, and D, we're kind of, we're kind of um, getting to the area of the past that we're looking for. And then uh, it's still virtual. But in order, so in order for that to become actual, in order for it to gain some kind of materiality, it has to come back down that, we have to reverse that process, condense into the perception, so that the perception is never, right, it's never pure perception. We talked about pure perception um, last week, was it last week? We talked, we've talked about it anyway, and uh, it was an abstraction. That's something which never happens in reality. We never just have pure perceptions. And I don't even think that that term makes sense. It doesn't mean anything. Every perception is, is infused with the past, with our memories, you know. Um, and I think if it, if it wasn't, if, if there was such a thing as a perception that, that has no connection to a past or that has no connection to desire or um, a goal or you know, to the future, then it would, there would be no perception. It wouldn't mean anything. The thing wouldn't be anything. It would just be a lump of matter. It wouldn't have any kind of relevance, wouldn't have any significance wouldn't have any sense. Back to Milo Ponte. Um, so anyway, that's that's this idea of recognition, willed recognition, and that's that's um, what Bergson has to say about it. I want to move now to the final part of the video today, which is um, I want to just go back to per perception, revisit that for a moment. Okay, so complete perception, I've talked about this before, is pure perception combined with memory images. So centripetal from the external object, right from the perception, and centrifugal from memory. So we've got those two, um, always those two forces kind of working together. We've abstracted them out. We, we, we talked about pure perception, um, and we'll talk about pure memory in the next video, but those two things are just abstra abstractions. They never exist on their own. They're meaningless on their own. They have to be understood as, as a totality, as a whole. Um, okay, so perception is... <clears throat> In this pairing, perception is the lesser, according to Bergson, for Bergson. Its main role is to call up the recollection. That's an interesting thing to say there, right? Perception is the lesser. Um, I'm, I think what he means, because his everything in Bergson is all about the practical, right? It's about um, action, praxis, being, being involved with things in the world. Uh, but I think what he means is that what perception does is it, it's it's almost like a passive role. It sets up that field. It, it creates the that nascent action, that nascent movement, which pulls the memory out of pulls the appropriate memory images image out of memory for us. So it, it doesn't have kind of an active role in this. What's, um, what's, what's filling that perception with meaning, with significance, is the memory. Uh, so he says we don't go from the perception to the idea. We go from the idea to the perception. But the perception creates the field. It creates the, sketches out the move, the, the field so I was looking for sketches out the the form in which the uh, the memory will fit. 
but it's when the memory comes to it that's when we get the meaning that's when we get significance going from the perception to the idea would be mechanical that's the mechanical process right it's the opposite and it can't produce recognition because raw data raw sensory impressions lack sense they lack meaning it's only through the memory images that sense arises <clears throat> uh, nice so that's cool I like that there's one more diagram I want to show you today uh, and it's this one and it's how memory a pure memory and perception are related through memory images so if we have a look at that that diagram, perception is, we've got pure memory on the left, memory images in the middle, perception on the right. Um, perception there, it's always impregnated with memory images. And memory images partake of pure memory, which they realize when they embody themselves in perception. And pure memory Although in independent in theory, um, and to some extent we can think of it separately, only ever manifests in the coloured and living perception. So all of those, th those three facets there, pure memory, memory images, and perception, they're all a bundle. They all come together. Like I said before, we can abstract them out, we can talk about them on their own, but they don't exist abstracted out from the whole. Uh, and this is exactly like what Heidegger was talking about with being in the world. He took that phrase, divided it up into three, um, being, being in, and, and the world, and, uh, and analyzed them. But he was clear they don't make any sense on their own. We can't talk about being that's not in the world. We can't talk about a world that doesn't have being. We can't talk about being in unless it's caught up with these ideas, this idea of being and in the world. So it's the same thing here. We, we, can, we can break them apart just to explain them in more detail, to be clear about what they are, but they don't make any sense on their own. And that, I think, is, is the biggest um, error that science falls into. It takes the exact opposite approach. The whole is an illusion. The whole isn't real. What is real for science are the pieces that make up the whole. So it has the exact opposite approach to reality. Um, and I think, yeah, well, obviously, I'm on Bergson's side. Uh and so we see with association then, um, and that there's that line down the middle, MP, that, uh, what is that? that? That's the associationist divide. That's what how associationism treats this picture of, of, of uh, rec recognition. It divides along that line MP, so we've got sensation um, on the right, and the memory image on the left. Sensation is the matter, memory image is the brain, uh, and there's no pure memory in this picture. It's all just, it's all physical, right? Or it has to be. It's, it's a materialist account. Um, so that there's no such thing as pure memory. That doesn't mean anything in a, in a purely physical world. Um, all you've got is sensation, which is the object, the external objects, and the memory image, which is in the brain. We'll forget about, we'll forget the problem of how the brain generates it, uh, which, which, which people seem to believe is still something which can be explained, but um, for Bergson, obviously it can't. But with that, with that dichotomy, sensation and memory, memory image, um, there's only a difference of degree between sensation and the memory. So 
taking, um, I think Hume said this, memory is just a faded or dim perception. And so when you have that, that, um, that sense, I think, um, it's difficult to go from there. That just, it doesn't, it fits very uncomfortably in Bergson's philosophy. And I think it, it doesn't map onto the world either. When we have a memory, it's not actually just a dim perception. That's not our experience of, of a memory. We don't think, we never get confused by vivid memories and at current perceptions, right? You never wonder, am I, am I remembering this or am I, am I seeing it now? No matter how vivid the memory is. Um, and so memory is never um, like a perception, just less clear or less distinct. Memories are always, they always come from the past. We always know that they're past. So there, there is a, a clear difference there for Bergson. And that, for him, um, makes that picture incorrect, where there's a difference only of degree between memory images and, um, and the sensation, the, the matter. And that, that's because they're the same thing, right? They are, everything's happening on the same plane, the same level of, you know, the same material plane. So the difference is just a difference of degree. Bergson, though, wants to say that um, even though the whole line there, A to D, is one process, we can't, we can't draw a clear line between any, either of the, between any of those pure memory, memory image or perception. Um, <clears throat> the past for Bergson, memory, is absolutely different from the present perception. So pure memory is a difference in kind, not a difference in degree. And that is the dualism that, that Bergson subscribes to here. Pure memory versus the um, perception in this diagram. So anyway, that is what I wanted to say about memory, memory and perception. Let's have a look at a summary. So first we looked at, we talked about memory, talked about the way that part, the past survives in two forms, as either habit memory or as memory images. Then we looked at the recognition, how those memories are recalled. There were two different ways for that as well. Instantaneous, which was um, characterized by inattention, so locked up with motor tendencies. Um, we talked about the feel or the, uh, the memory being kind of in the body, in the hand, uh, that nice expression. And the second form of recognition was willed or, or recognition through attention. And in this, we looked at reflective perception. So we looked at that diagram, uh, which traced the way that, that we go from that perception. We go into memory and the, the appropriate memory is drawn out. But the important thing to remember from that section was that movement creates a field which draws the memory out. So it's, it's a very bodily focused idea we are fundamentally embodied and to the extent that um, <clears throat> our bodies play a pivotal role in recollection in remembering things it's not just a mental effort it's not just cognitive that, then that really is the if you're going to remember one thing from today's video i think that's the one to remember Finally, we looked at perception again. We revisited this idea. And through that diagram, that second diagram, we saw it's a whole. So you've got pure memory, memory images, and perception. Uh, and they are a whole. We, we can't cle cleanly um, draw a line between you know, when pure memory ends and mem the memory image begins and when memory images end and when perception begins. They're all, it's all blended together. 
However, the past is absolutely different from the present. So there's, even though they, they all, they always come together, they're a package deal, if you like, um, still, the past is something fundamentally different, a difference in kind from the present. And that is where I'm going to finish. So if you have stuck with me for this, this whole video, thank you. I hope you got something out of it. And uh, I'll catch you for the next video. We'll, we'll look at pure memory in a bit more detail.